Um, many thank you. Uh, many thanks to all of you uh, for participating in such a special day. I mean, it's just been so heartwarming and such a, an inclusive atmosphere today. And uh, so it's just timely that I was invited to speak about inclusion and integration today. And I look forward to sharing some of my thoughts um, with you and some of my experience. Um, my story started um, 20, uh, 22 years ago, 1998, when I first visited an institution for children with uh, mental and physical disabilities. You wouldn't know whether the children there have autism, didn't have autism. It was impossible to say because all children were in bed there because they were sick. That was the uh, approach at the time. If you had, a, had any type of um, defect, you were sick and you were kept in bed. And so all the children's limbs were contracted because their muscles weren't being used. And whether, even if the child did have an uh, autistic spectrum disorder, um, you wouldn't know. They were all physically compromised by being in an institution. So this was the start of my work in Azerbaijan because I didn't want to see this. Nobody wants to see this. We want to see children happy, in their family, at school, socializing with other children. So my theory from that time uh, started that um, if you base reforms on putting the needs of children with disabilities at the center of reforms, those reforms will work for all children. So whether it's health reform, welfare reform, education reform, the needs of children with disabilities at the center, all children uh, will benefit. I think it's uh, oops. Excuse me. Um, I think it's important to understand the um, uh, the origins of the, the different models to know where we are today. And so, um, the medical model, the social model, and the rights-based model gives us a very good um, background to to where we are now. So. Um, a rights-based model is obviously the most empowering model because it puts the decision-making in the hands of the child or the adult with a disability rather than the, the medical system or the community. It, it, the child or the adult is the, uh, is the one whose right it is to be part of education, to be part of a system, part of community. Um, but it's still a dominant model today in many, many countries. Um, children, families, they go to the doctor, a very minimal assessment, the doctor diagnoses and then refers them to uh, specialists who treat the children one-on-one, -on -one, a series of individual therapies, which is still a medical approach because it's trying to fix the problem in a very uh, limited, isolated context rather than trying to look at the um, issue that the child or adult is facing within a social context. So we have to understand that if we want to reform a system. Shifting from the medical model to the social model, I believe, is driven by economic change. All, all social changes and economic changes go hand in hand. Um, and I, and I, do, um, I do think that uh, when industrialization uh, uh, started, the, the uh, education system was developed based on the needs of industrialization. Go to work in a factory, turn up on time, do what your manager tells you to do, go home. Um, but that, that time is past now. We're moving more and more into the technological age, and I believe strongly that uh, technology is driving uh, inclusion. Um, because with technology, it enables more people with disabilities to become part of society. It helps them in many different ways. And if you're talking by internet, by telephone, by um, Skype, WhatsApp, whatever, you're communicating. And, and your disability, who you are, you know, what issues you have, is, it becomes obsolete. It doesn't matter. The technology is helping you communicate. So I strongly believe that Technology is the driving force in, uh, in, in it should be the, it is becoming the driving force in teaching. It's the driving force uh, towards inclusion. Sorry, move on. 
So we also need to understand uh, the difference of system, different systems. So special education, integrated education, and inclusive education are, are three quite different systems that people sometimes um, confuse. Um, obviously, special education is, uh, is practiced uh, the most around the world, where children with disabilities are, are, are educated in special schools. And I've visited quite a few of these special schools, and, and, and some of the needs of these children are so um, uh, intense that they need a whole team around them. Like, uh, they may need one-on-one -on -one attention the whole day long. But still, uh, the move then towards integrated education to bring more disabled children into a mainstream school, where maybe they're having some classes together, but they're also having their um, separate lessons. That a, is a move in the right direction, but obviously inclusion, inclusive education is where every child um, is, is uh, studying, working together, socializing together, and learning from each other. Uh, as um, one of the, uh, Aisha said this morning about bullying, how do we stop bullying if we keep children separated? We only stop bullying when people start to overcome their fears about other children who are different or adults overcome their fears about uh, difference. And that's not going to happen when we keep children separated in education. We only uh, can address the bullying if we bring children together and talk with them and talk with parents and talk with teachers to help them everybody overcome their fears which lead to the bullying. I love this uh, picture because I think it defines so well the difference between inclusive and not inclusive systems. So imagine you've got greasy hands, or you don't have any hands, or your hands are, are contracted. A round door handle you're not going to be able to use, but you can use a straight door handle. You don't have to use your hand, you can use your elbow, you can use something else, but it's an inclusive way of opening the door. And I think uh, maybe sometimes we all need to see visuals to fully understand what is inclusion and what is not inclusion. And I think that this visual helps uh, a lot to be able to get to grips with what it means. So I think that teachers should be like the straight door handle. They're the ones who open the child's mind, who opens our minds to learning. And so really, if we're going to have an inclusive system, we need to change the way teaching, uh, the way teachers teach. So they're teaching for all children, not just for um, a, a narrow group of children that they are able to teach. And, and I just also like to emphasize that um, inclusive education isn't just limited to children with disabilities. There are many children who are excluded from education because they come from very poor families or they live very far away from uh, the nearest school or maybe they have emotional and behavioral problems because they're witnessing domestic violence at home or they, their, their parents have died. I mean, there are many reasons why children uh, may drop out of school. And so inclusive education is looking at all the children, not a narrow group of children or just children with disabilities, is looking at how to include all children. And for that, it's about teaching style. So this is a typical teacher-centered learning. Pass the children are passive. They're looking at the teacher. The teacher is the, um, the focus of their attention and the focus of the class. Um, there's little interaction between the children. If all children are looking in one direction, they're not working with each other, they're not communicating with each other. Books, subjects separated into, into divisions. So this is a typical teacher-centered uh, classroom, which is a dominant model in many, uh, many systems. And uh, I think that this uh, cartoon represents very well, like, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, and critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. So if we're trying to encourage children to be creative and innovative, we can't do that through a teacher-centered model very easily.
Whereas child-centered learning, this is where um, the interaction uh, between the teacher and the children, between the children and each other, um, enables all children to participate at whatever, le whatever level they are able to participate. The curriculum is integrated, meaning that you might uh, learn about maths and science or geography and science, or you, know, or you take a theme and you look at all subjects around that theme. And it encourages a lifelong uh, desire for learning in, uh, in the child. And we need to think about assessment because at the end of the day, all education leads to an outcome for children. And how we rate that outcome determines how inclusive our teaching is. So if we're rating a child's, uh, if, we're, if all the assessment systems are based on memory, based on learning a few facts and then repeating them in a, in a test, some of the children will be able to do that, some of the children might need more time, some of the children may need other ways to show that they understand the subject. And let's, uh, let's just remember that memory-based test doesn't uh, assess how well a child is taking that knowledge and using it and applying it in practice, which for lifelong skills may be more essential than just being able to remember something for the one hour exam you've got and then you forget it. I mean, I know I can't remember anything from, from my uh, studies in the past, you know, that when I had to learn for a test. Yet what I learned through practice, what I learned through interaction with other children has stayed with me for life. We need to look at the child's functionality. I mean, we are all different. Every child is different. Um, and if we are assessing everybody on one very narrow method of assessment, we're not taking into account that all children are different. So that's why this, um, di this uh, cartoon is a, is a very apt description of a testing process. For, every, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. One can climb the tree very well. The elephant is never going to climb that tree. Doesn't mean the elephant can't do something different better than the monkey. So how we test children is, determines the inclusivity of our systems. This is a, a tool typically used um, in uh, inclusive education. It's the inclusive education plan. And it's based on the idea that uh, around the child is a team of people working together to support the inclusion. So it's the teacher and the parent, the doctor, the occupational therapist, physiotherapist, speech therapist, psychologist, and so on and so forth. Um, they all know the child. They observe the child. They assess and regularly evaluate the child's progress. But what, you, what do you do if you're working in a system which doesn't have all those specialists, where those resources aren't available? So what, what we've done in my work, uh, myself and my team, is we, um, we've tried to take that uh, uh, system and sort of encapsulate it uh, in our training with a group of people. So try to build all the, give everybody a toolbox. So, um, and we've had some very good successful results over the years. In September 2018, we um, successfully included 241 children into mainstream education. Um, you can see the, some of the regions. These were children who, in, who included through our preschool, inclusive preschool services, because we start inclusion from the age of two through our services. If you start from such a young age, you're going to overcome the stigmas uh, that other children may uh, feel towards children who are different because they get, you know, they're all playing together at that age, so they don't notice any difference. They're just children. Seventy-four of, the ch of that 240 children uh, came through our early intervention services, so this is where we work with the medical system. Um, and the early intervention service provider is responsible for supporting the participation of the children um, into community. And we also had uh, a number of children coming through our community-based rehabilitation centers. 
um, and uh, accessing mainstream education in various regions. So th this was a great success. Um, all the children's cases are documented. The challenges have been once a child is in the school, there it becomes a, a bit uh, difficult because the, the teachers, the schools, and the local departments of education need more training, need more support to understand um, the benefits of inclusion. But we're all working on that together, and I'm sure with such a good start, we'll achieve it. So coming back to what is inclusion, I just want to emphasize these points. It's good teaching. It's good teachers, and it's good schools. And I just want to re-emphasize my theory that if you want to reform a system, so uh, for children with disabilities, put their needs at the center of reform. So if, because that will then support the needs of all children. Now, just a couple of little things for those who may not be familiar. Um, you know, this is a contentious issue, the idea of uh, children's learning styles. Um, but it's worth thinking about because it helps to shift the mind from the teacher-dominated uh, style of teaching to more child-centered. If as a teacher you are aware that uh, children, that we all have uh, multiple different learning styles and we may plan a class around those learning styles, introducing different types of activities that may suit one child more than another child, but uh, around a common theme, this can help to support the inclusion of more, more children into, into the class, into the, into the education. And as we are, I've been talking quite generally, but as we're talking specifically about autism today, um, I asked our occupational therapist who um, works with us and uh, who's very experienced in supporting inclusion in the UK, in South Africa, um, she helped me prepare some information about what she would do to support inclusion in the classroom. So these are the typical issues that a child with uh, autistic spectrum uh, disorder on the autistic spectrum may have issues with in the classroom. And so first, it's important as a therapist, occupational therapist, to know, you know, to be, uh, be aware, of course, and then start planning um, interventions. So if the child is having difficulty um, processing um, the, the various uh, inputs on their senses, they may find um, the environment they're in quite disturbing. Um, so an occupational therapist may advise the teacher or the school administration on how to um, overcome some of these sensory overloads on a child. Um, and, you know, often a teacher will say, why should I do this? You know, why, you know, that child shouldn't be in my classroom. You know, I'm focusing on all the other children. Sometimes they can humiliate the child take away the, what they have with them to make them feel comfortable. Um, this is the type of practice that we really need to try and uh, eradicate, you know, that uh, help the teachers understand better that all children have needs and some have more special needs than others. So, uh, again, bringing movement into the classroom, uh, helping the children who may be uh, very uh, uh, under-responsive, various different issues. I just wanted to bring this today because there, I know there's a, a lot of people in the audience today who may not have uh, come across these ideas before, may be looking for um, uh, tips to help them in their classroom. I just wanted to give some idea of an example of what you may want to uh, use or how to seek more, um, more support, more uh, advice and training to help your class. So I hope that uh, the issues I've raised are um, relevant for you in your context. And I think the key principle, the key issue that I'm trying to underline is we should be helping all children to uh, adapt to the social context. And that is what school is all about, is to socialize, help children to socialize as well as learn. So keeping children with special needs 
separate from uh, the mainstream uh, is never going to help. Those children, it's not going to help other children to become, um, uh, to reduce that fear, that uh, defensiveness and, and, and that bullying that can go on in mainstream schools. So inclusion from as young as possible, change the style of teaching from teacher-centered to child-centered, and, and, uh, and reform based on the needs of disabled children, not on the needs of typical children. Thank you. So I think, Sarah, yeah. You want to stand up here and speak? Yeah. Do you have a voice? Yeah. Okay. Just push the button. Oh, that one, okay. So hi, uh, my name is Sarah Borgerding, um, and that last name is why the kids often call me uh, Miss B or Miss Sarah. Um, and I love being a school counselor. I have worked with a wide variety of students over my 25 year career as a school counselor and educator. I am a passionate student advocate who stands up for students with differences, whether those differences be economic, cultural, neurodiversity, or other learning differences. After high school, I completed a bachelor's degree in comparative liter literature, a degree of literary theory and philosophy, looking at how meaning is made. And I wrote my undergraduate thesis in German and in English. After earning my bachelor's degree, I went back to high school near Seattle, Washington, and spent a year working as a special education aide before I worked in international business. After two years in international business, which I was good at, but I did not like, I went back to university and added a certificate of teach and licensure of teaching English as a second language. I taught English to kids and adults, mostly new immigrants to the United States until I joined the Peace Corps in 1995, where I served as an English as a second language teacher. I love teaching, but teaching English as a second language where I was expected to be able to spell correctly on the spot was challenging. So I went back to university and earned a master's degree in psychology with straight A's, mind you. I point this out not to brag, but to preface the fact that I am diagnosed with dyslexia and have an SLD or specific learning disability in math. I am open about this fact because I want people to hear that having a brain that works differently does not mean that it is less. It does not mean that a human who is different has less to give to the world than any other person in this room. I am neurodiverse. So what do I mean by neurodiversity? The range of differences in the individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as, as part of normal variations in the human population. The key part to me of this is this, the part that it is part of the normal diversity of the human brain function and experience. This is not an illness. This is not a sickness. I am different and is sometimes, as much as I want to deny it, normal. As an example, when I was about 40 years old, I read a book about the traits and asset, assets of dyslexia. The book said that it was common for dyslexics to think in images instead of in words. It went on to enumerate why this asset helps dyslexics to be good at thinking outside of the box and coming up with unique perspectives and solutions on the world's issues. I thought, cool, wait, not everyone thinks in images? It was a revelation that that was not everyone's experience. So I asked some people I knew, some did, and some had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. I was also to be able with this information to realize why I often use analogy when I'm teaching and when I'm speaking. I'm trying to explain the images that are visual, visible to me in my mind's eye. Dyslexia is one example of neurodiversity in the world. Here are some of the others. The autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, ADD, 
gifted, cultural diverse, anxiety, OCD, and the list goes on. For today's short speech, I'm choosing to address the individuals with lower support needs, who look or may seem normal or neurotypical like myself, who are often labeled as stupid or not capable based on lack of knowledge and understanding. This assumption is wrong. I am 50, and I am, capable, I am a capable self-advocate. I have learned to set people straight, but I know that not everyone else is able to do that for themselves, yet. So this is one of the reasons that I challenge you to learn how to support these kids. I am here to stand for difference and to talk to you about seeing students for what they can do and look for ways to support their growth rather than focusing on where they have colored outside of the lines or not met traditional expectations. I am not where I am or where I would be without spell checkers, extra time, the people who helped me learn to be a self-advocate and stand up for what I needed. Whoops. <laughs> like Miss Story, my second grade teacher, who took time to translate my dyslexic language into English so that others could understand or the editors that my university hired to spell check my undergraduate thesis in English and German, or my 10th grade math teacher who put me in advanced math because she could see that I understood the concepts rather than just looking as at the dyslexic confused answers and helped me to feel challenged in math rather than bored. Autism is also neurodiverse and is often understood as a spectrum like this. I find this image actually confusing. I see straight line of spectra, to a space, the straight line analogy as one that doesn't work very well for the reality of how people experience neurodiversity. It tries to put things into neat boxes and definitions that do not work well from my understanding. So I want to give you a different way, excuse me, a different way to look at students on the autistic spectrum. My own daughter, who is currently, I'm proud to say, earning high honors in her first year of the IB diploma at TISA, is also a, has been diagnosed as autistic. She's the one who turned me on to this model. Instead of looking at autism as a linear spectrum, let's look at it as a wheel. This model makes it easier to spot how we might Oops. <laughs> Support each individual student to meet their own needs. A circle shows us an individual strengths and areas of where support might be helpful. So as an example, on this spectrum, you, this way of looking at it, you can see that someone might have strong, um, uh, fine motor skills, but weaker uh, gross motor skills. They might have high language ability, um, but may have I issues with social interaction. And they can be, those points can be on different points on this spectrum. It, it allows us to see where those strengths are that we can use, and also that where we can use our strategies imp, that we're implementing in the classroom to best help the student. I find this next slide a helpful thing to think about. Most all of us have experienced noises that annoy us, that make us shiver, like fingernails on a chalkboard or feeling language loss, being surrounded by people who are speaking another language that we're struggling to understand. An unpleasant touch, someone who touches us that makes us feel uncomfortable. And we're not sure why, but it does. A smell, we all have a smell that we can't stand, that someone else doesn't bother them at all, right? Word shutters. Words that, that we just we struggle to say in English, a common word that people have a hard time with for some reason is the word moist. Textures, so we like some things and we don't like other things, right? And when we're jet lagged or sleep deprived, it's even harder for us to manage and cope with things that, are, that make us feel uncomfortable in the world. So we have a vague idea of what a student um, that might be self-stimming or having a breakdown or just struggling to listen and respond. We have some ideas of what that might feel like. 
And therefore, it's important that we also look at how we can address those students' needs. And I'm sure most of you have seen this picture. Right? This is not about giving everyone the same thing. It's about addressing the individual needs of a student. I like this one in particular because it's got the, the kid in the wheelchair. Right? We're allowing everybody to access the playing field. Without it being able to access the playing field, they're not going to be able to learn. So when I'm talking about supports, again, I'm, I'm addressing the, the low need support, the students with low need supports. Here are some of the two of the very common things that I deal with on a weekly basis. A kid with anxiety levels, inside or out of the classroom. Having a space with a weighted blanket and a room to get away to when they need to. The ability to simply get up and walk out of a classroom and leave a little toy on their desk so the teacher knows they're in the room under the blanket and they know where they're going. And that's okay. The kid comes back when they are able. Extra time on tests and activities. Teach, uh, teaching techniques like grounding or breathing. Mindfulness activities. Those are, these, are off, these are also things that are good for the entire school community. Right? For sound or sensory issues, letting kids leave the room when it gets crazy or noisy, having a place for them to set aside in a quiet space to work on an exam, allowing students to have sound canceling earphones is also, these are very simple things that are not going, to, not going to impact the teaching that's going on in the classroom very much, but are going to have massive potential impacts on, on children. And I can speak of this as a mother with my own child. She would not be getting, without these simple things, she would not be able to do what she's currently doing. My bottom line is this. Every time you give an assessment, I agree with Gwen completely, so this comes down to assessment. When we're giving an assessment in any kind of a classroom or learning situation, the fundamental question has to be, what are we really trying to assess? If you're trying to assess, for myself, if you're trying to assess whether I can understand the math, or are you trying to understand whether I can do the math in a classroom full of people under a certain amount of time and, and where I have to be quiet, if that's what you're trying to assess, okay, I'm not going to do very well. If you're trying to assess, can I do this math and do I understand what I'm doing, then I need a room and extra time so that I can show you that I understand that math. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now we have a young man, Imdat, who's going to speak to us from the seated position. Okay. Okay. Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья, дамы и господа. Разрешите представиться. Меня зовут Имдат. Я очень Долго жил в Торонто. Я гражданин Канады, но сейчас живу в Баку. Год назад я с моим другом открыли центр гармоничного развития детей на базе уникальной технологии. Там я преподаю развивающиеся игры на внимание. Потом эти игры как управление, суфлер, твое мнение, ПЗ, уметь делегировать ответственность. Дальше. Я даже часами сижу, чтобы говорить о ней. Я обожаю свою работу. А сейчас я расскажу о себе любимом. Как надо любить себя и научиться это делать. Если бы вы видели меня раньше, вы были бы в шоке, вы бы 
удивились. Раньше я был толстый, глупый и ленивый бездельник. На меня невозможно было смотреть. Я все откладывал на потом, сам other day. Им дат сидел на диване, жрал булочки и весил 115 килограмм. Но сейчас я изменился в лучшую сторону. У меня есть график. Во-первых, я на прошлой неделе похудел на 5 килограмм, на этой на 2 килограмма. Я встаю в 5 утра на пробежку, на турнике подтягиваюсь 10 раз, сейчас уже 12, бруси на брусьях подтягиваюсь 15 раз, тренажеры, еще тренировка йога, кунг-фу, танец цигун. Танго, это есть танго, хожу на танцы, на рисование хожу, занимаюсь вывеписью и на лепку. Я и сам рисую дома, еще собираюсь лепить. Пару недель назад я купил пластилин. Дальше, еще я хожу на дюдо, ходил на джиу-джитсу, занимаюсь еще воинскими искусствами. Еще я вкусно готовлю разные блюда, разные рецепты, очень вкусные. Еще я раньше играл на альте, у меня дядя с маминой стороны скрипач. Еще я рад, что я научился драться, боксировать. Если даже у меня, у человека есть элементы борьбы, это не значит, что он должен плохо боксировать. Дальше. Хотя я пару раз срывался, меня чуть не уволили с работы, штрафовался я на 500 евро, даже письмо приходило. Потом мы с Назой, как два директора компании, говорили, почему я должен вести себя неадекватно. И После этого я взял на себя ответственность. Спасибо. Я отключал телефон на работе, не общался на отвлеченные темы. Ответственность – это когда тебе дают ПЗ, постановка задач, поставленную задачу, и нужно заняться. Еще, когда ты должен вести себя очень адекватно, особенно когда ты подписывал контракт. Еще я преподавал Conversation Club, делал переводы. Я очень благодарен своим родителям друзьям, родственникам и близким за их поддержку и любовь. Еще говорят, что не сдается тот, кто сильнее своей судьбы. Спасибо всем, кто пришли. Thank you, Imdat. I think we're all in awe of your exercise <laughs> prowess, and you could, we've all got a lot of work to do. So now I'd like to invite um, uh, Nazila up. Yeah? Okay. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Queen. I would like uh, to share my experience with you. Mende herkesi salamlayıram. Uh, i̇lk önce teşkilatçılara çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Ee, bu layihinin rehberi, özellikle de Suzana Hanım'a minnettara. Ee, özüm de teşkilat işlerinin içinde olduğum için çok büyük zahmet ve eziyet bahasına bu kongresin erseğe geldiğini şahidiyem. Ee, ve bize bu şaraiti yarattığı için de özellikle Heydar Aliye Fondu'na minnettarıq. Ee, mən ilk önce özüm hakkında küçük məlumat vermek istedim. Mən e, ixtisasca filologam, ama pedagoji təhsilim var və mən uzun iller e, jurnalist kimi bir çox tanmış kütləvi informasiya vasitələrində redaktor jurnalist kimi fəaliyyət göstərmişəm e, və həyatımda baş verən böyük bir dəyişiklik nəticəsində mən yenidən pedagoji fəaliyyətimə geri dönmüşəm. Ve artık 15 ildir ki, 11 sayılı xüsusi təhsil məktəbində müəllim kimi fəaliyyat göstereceğim. Ve eyni zamanda Ümit Var Xeyriyyə Könüllüleri Təşkilatının rəhbəriyim. Mən e, 11 sayılı xüsusi təhsil məktəbində işlediğim müddətdə e, bilirsiniz, dövlət məktəbidir, e, artık çerçevelerimiz var. Ve ben gördüm ki artık bu çerçevelerden çıkmak vaktimdi çünkü hakikaten de ders dediğim şahların ve muhtelif ailelerin desteğine çatmak istedim ve onların cemiyeti integrasi olunmasına küme olmak istedim. Onun için de ben Ümit Var Xeyriyyə Könüllüleri Təşkilatını yarattım. Bir müəllim olarak qeyd etmək istəyirəm ki, çok yaxşı bilirəm ki, her bir uğurlu insan onu, ona inanan ve onu motive edən bir müəllimi ömrü boyu hatırlayır. Ve ben de hümeşe o müəllimlerden olmaq istəmişim. Ve bunun için de keyfiyetli tähsil için bir çox yerli ve beynalxalq e, lahiyelerin, e, təlimlerin iştirakçısıyam. E, Ümit Var Xeyriyyə Könülleri Təşkilatı olarak biz e, fəaliyyətine başladık. Mən e, bilirəm ki, belki de çoxlarınızda təccüb yaranacak ki, xüsusi təhsil məktəbi və inkluzivlik. E, ama danışdıqlarımı eşitdikdən sonra inanıram ki, siz də əmin olacaqsınız ki, neyin ki xüsusi təhsil məktəbinin müəlliməsi, hətta cəmiyyətin bir üzvü olarak da e, inkluziv cəmiyyət üçün böyük tövbələr vermək olar. E, mən cəmiyyətdə ümumiyyətlə cəmiyyətdə nələrinsə dəyişməsini istəyirəmsə, bunun üçün mütləq şəkildə özümdən başlamalı olduğumu çok yaxşı bilirəm. Ve bunun için de inkluziv cemiyet için ben özüm bir adım attım. Ve rehberli ettiğim teşkilatla beraber çok uğurlu bir lahiyeler hayata geçirdik. İnkluziv cemiyete tövbe olarak. E, Birge ve Sağlam İctimai Birliği ile beraber bu lahiyelerimizi, autizmle bağlı olan lahiyelerimizi hayata geçirmişik. E, bugün de mevzu autizm olduğu için ben sırf autizmle bağlı gördüğümüz işleri bir bağlıca hatırlatmak istedim. Demek ki, e, Azerbaycan'da ilk defa olarak autizm spektr pozuntusu olan uşaqların defilesini təşkil etmişik. E, xüsusi olarak onlara kolleksiya hazırlanıp ve onlar podyuma çıxaraq bu kolleksiyanı nümayiş elətdiriblər. 3 yıl biz bu lahiyyini hayata geçirmişik. Müxtəlif modeliyerler her yıl bu lahiyyı için xüsusi kolleksiyalar hazırlayıb. Daha sonra ise biz e, bu lahiyyini biraz da genişlendirdik. Ötün yıl Heydar Aliye Fondunun dəsteyi ilə bu lahiyyə Artık Autizm Medeniyet Festivalı çerçevesinde hayata geçirildi ve biz bununla yanaşı ilk defa olarak Autizm Spektr pozuntusu olan uşaqların resm eserlerinden ibaret sergini de teşkil etmişik. Ben gördüğümüz işlerle işleri burada danışmakta niyetim nedi? Niyetim odur ki bizim bu işleri gördüğümüz sırada. Öğrendiğimiz ve tedbik ettiğimiz bir mesele oldu. 
Mən Antoninanın çıxışında vurğuladığı bir məsələni xüsusi vurğulayacağım. Bu stereotipleri həqiqətən də qırmaq vaxtıdır. Autizm spektr pozuntusu olan uşaqlar həqiqətən də çox rahat şəkildə cəmiyyətə inteqrasiya ola bilər və cəmiyyətin bir üzvü ola bilərlər. Bunun üçün isə biz cəmiyyət olaraq hazır olmalıyıq. Həqiqətən də biz əlilliyin tibbi yanaşmasından, əlilliyin sosial yanaşmasına keçməliyik. Yəni, biz bilirik ki, ümumiyyətlə, dünyada inkluziv təhsil inkişaf mərhələsindədir və inkluziv təhsilin müxtəlif ölkələrdə inkişafı cəmiyyətin inkişafından asılıdır və eyni zamanda cəmiyyətin müxtəlif resurslarından asılı olaraq dəyişir və biz də cəmiyyət olaraq, yəni dövlət olaraq dövlət öz boyuna düşən vəzifələri kifayət qədər yerinə yetirilir və biz bu günlərim kifayət qədər xüsusi qayğı ehtiyacı olan uşaqların ilə bağlı gözəl lahiyyələrin həyata keçirdiyini görürük. Biz cəmiyyət olaraq nə qədər buna hazırıq? Mən çox təəssüflər hissi ilə, ailələrlə işləyən, eyni zamanda bu işin içində olan bir adam kimi söyləmək istəyirəm ki, hələ də Təhsil Nazirliyinin qarşısında piketlər keçirən valideynlərimiz var. Hələ də normal inkişaf etmiş uşaqlarının inkluziv siniflərdə olmasını istəməyən, sağlamlıq imkanları məhdud uşaqlarla bərabər təhsil almasını istəməyən valideynlərimiz var. Və çox təəssüf ki, hələ də bunları müşahidə edən və qəbul olunmadıqların üçün göz yaşları tökən analarımız var. Mən BMT qarşısında götürdüyümüz öhdəlikləri, UNESCO-nın əlilliklə bağlı hüquqların, konvensiyalarını bilir və onu bir qırağa qoyaraq, bir millət kimi insanlıq olaraq biz axı həqiqətən də mədəniyyətlərə, dinlərə, dinlərə, tolerant, açıq bir xalqıq. Nədən biz hələ də Mən belə düşünürəm ki, sovetlər dövründən qalma bir düşüncədən çıxa bilmirik. Çünki çoxlarınız yaxşı bilir ki, sovetlər dövründə bu uşaqlara xüsusi yanaşma var idi. Yəni, nəyin ki, uşaqlar, hətta ailələr belə cəmiyyətdən təcrid olunurdular və artıq bu etapları keçdik. Və mən düşünürəm ki, cəmiyyət olaraq biz... O uşaqları olduqları kimi bütün fərqlilikləri ilə qəbul edib, onları həqiqətən siz cəmiyyətin ayrılmaz bir parçasısınız, ayrılmaz bir hissəsisiniz mesajını verməliyik. O zaman o uşaqlar çox rahatlıqla inteqrasiya olunacaqlar və inkluziv cəmiyyət üçün də hər kəs bir addım atmış olacaq. Və mən çıxışımda onu da qeyd etmək istəyirəm ki, marifləndirmə aparmaq yolunda biz hər birimiz öz səyimizi göstərməliyik. Özəlliklə də övlatlarımız arasında bu marifləndirməni aparmalıyıq. Onlar da necə yanaşmalı olduqlarını, bərabər hüquqlu olduqlarını anlatmalıyıq. Yəni, uşaqlarımız bilməlidir ki, onlardan heç bir şəkildə nə üstündür, nə aşağıdır. Bərabər hüquqludurlar. Bunları sözdə yox, bunları əməldə artıq həyata keçirmək vaxtımızdır. Mən bir məsələni də xüsusi vurgulamaq istəyirəm. Övladlarımıza empati hissini qurmağa kömək olaq. Çünki beynəlxalq təcrübədə də var empati hisslərini qurmaq üçün uşaqların tamaşalar qoyulur və onlara sağlamlıq imkanları, məhdud dostlarının rollarını oynamaq tapışırılır və bu çox gözəl bir nümunədir və bunu da biz öz praktikamızda tətbiq etsək çox gözəl olar. Mən çıxışımın əvvəlində qeyd etdiyim kimi inkluziv cəmiyyətə bir tövbə, bir addım atmaq niyyəti ilə bu işə başlamışam və Autizm və digər cəqnızlı uşaqlarla da biz işləyirik və onların da sosiallaşması, cəmiyyətə inteqrasiya olunması yönündə işlər görürük. Və mən bu günlərim özümdən yenə başlayaraq, 
Yine bir cemiyet olarak, cemiyet, inkluziv bir cemiyetin formalaşması için bir adım atmak istedim. Ben öz şagirdim Ayhan Guluzayda'nı bura davet etmek istedim. Bir dedim ki Ayhan autizm spektr pozuntusu olan ve bizim mektebin sevimli şagirdlerinden biridir. Salam Ayxan. Salam. Necəsən? Yaxşıyam. Ayxan özünü təqdim et. Mən Qılcadı Ayxan, 11 növrəli xüsusun təhsil məktəbinin 6 sinifində oxuyuram. Musiqini çox sevirəm. Gələcəkdə musiqiçi olmaq istəyirəm. Bəli. Ayxan, bizim söhbətlərimizi bəyənirsən? Bəli, Nazlə Məlmə. Mən inanıram ki, bu görüş bizim həyatımızı dəyişəcək. Ayxan, nelerin değişmeyini istiyorsan? Cemiyet olarak biz neleri değiştirik? Sizin için yaşamak daha da güzel olar, daha da rahat olar. Nazlı Evvel Bey, biz olduğumuz gibi kabul etsinler, değişmeye çalışmasınlar. Avtobusamıyla da anlarımıza pis bakıp bu uşaqla niye avtobusamıyımı sen demesinler. Bizi xəstə adlandırmasınlar, biz xəstə deyiliriz, sadece farklı. Burada oturan bütün insanlar da farklıdır, heç kim bir-birini oxşamır. Düzdür. Bizimle anlayışlı karşılayın, mülayim davranın, biz axı sizi çok sevirik. Mən onda qeyd edim ki, Instagramda mallar oxuyup paylaşıram, mənim çoxlu dostlarım var, məni çok sevirlər. Esasında hərbiçilərdir. Kimler ki mənə dəlidir yazırlar. Mən onlara demək istəyirəm ki, biz dəli yox sizden fərqli. Biz cəmiyyətin ayrılmaz hissəsiyik. Ayxan, bura gəl, bura gəl. Mən bunu da xüsusi qeyd etmək istəyirəm ki, 3 dekabr Beynəlxalq Əlillər günü münasibəti ilə 11 sayılı xüsusi təhsil məktəbində bizim böyük bir tədbirimiz oldu və Ayxan orada Əməkdər Artist, Əməkdər Artist Fərqanə Qasımova ilə bərabər bir mahnı ifa etdi. Bu bizim xalq mahnımız Sarı Gəlin idi. Mən indi Ayxandan xayiş edəcəm, bu mahnı bizim üçün ifa etsin. Amma biz də mütləq dəstək olaq. İnanıram, güvenirəm. Başlaya bilərik. Bəli, hazıram. Satın ucun örməzlər, Gülü sulu dərməzlər, Sar gəlin. Satın ucun örməzlər, Gülü sulu dərbəzlər sar gəlim. Bu sevda nə sevdadır, səni mənə verməzlər. Neyni maman, aman, neyni maman, aman sar gəlim. Bu sevda nə sevdadır, səni mənə verməzlər. Neyni maman, aman, neyni maman, aman sarı gəlin. Çox sağ olun. Çox təşəkkür edirəm və... Çıxışımı Qurandan bir ayə ilə bitirmək istəyirəm. Zərrə qədər etdiyimiz yaxşılığın əvəzini alacaq və əksinə zərrə qədər etdiyimiz pisliyin əvəzini alacaq. Bugün bütün dinlər, deyiz, ateiz, hamı bir sözü deyir, hamı bu nöqtədə birdir. Bu cəmiyyətə nə ötürsən, o da geri qaydacaq. Sevgi ötürək. Və bu uşaqlara özəlliklə sev götürə mütləq sizə geri dönəcək. Dinlədiyiniz üçün təşəkkür edirəm. Çox sağ olun, Azəli xanım. Qısa jələniyə, mə pa vəriminə apazdıvayəm, no. Yəsə adın vəpros, qətər abidiniyət auditoriyu. Yəna, nəvərnə, xəçə yəvə zəvədə zədəz gvən. Gvən, vəri yəsək? 
the top three things which will be turning the society into the real inclusive one. What are the top three first things? Definitely technology. I mean, it's a driving force for everything these days. And um, I believe it's a driving force for the uh, change, the economic change um, that will make society more inclusive. Uh, because I do think that economy tends to lead social policy more than social leads economic policy. So that one's the first. Um, I also think that um, on trend these days is the whole transformation business, transforming us to become more self-aware and more empathetic with other people. And I think this will uh, also help to support uh, the uh, inclusive movement. And finally, better understanding and education, not of the children themselves, but of professionals as the medical uh, education and social welfare professionals become more practiced and experienced, of course, this will drive inclusion. So the conclusion is the knowledge will save the world. I mean, lifetime learning. Well, thank you so much for all of you. Uh, thank you for all joining this panel, which is extremely important. Um, я залу хотела бы напомнить, что вы можете еще обратить, обратиться к экспертам здесь и задать вопросы, пока они здесь. Вы можете вопросы задавать также на странице Фергли Фердлер в Фейсбуке, и мы попросим обязательно экспертов ответить. Thank you again. Спасибо большое. Чок